M S W Media. Big shout out today to Helix Sleep. Take their two minute sleep quiz and they'll match you to a mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. Helix is offering 25% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for listeners in honor of Black Friday. Go to helixsleep.com slash daily beans and use code helixpartner25. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Monday, November 13th, 2023. Today, Donald Trump's speech at New Hampshire channels Hitler and other fascist authoritarians. Special counsel Jack Smith notified the court in the D.C. case that Trump's attorneys misled them. Ohio Republicans are trying to keep the courts from interpreting the new abortion rights amendment. The feds are targeting a GOP super PAC that took COVID loans. New York Mayor Eric Adams has had his phones and iPad seized by the FBI. The Michigan legislature has passed a bill that would allow 16 and 17 year olds to pre-register to vote. A Tennessee man admits to conspiring with a January 6th defendant to kill FBI agents. It's time to update your talking points on U.S. oil production. And in a very rare move, the Pope ousts a conservative bishop after he refused to step down following a Vatican investigation. I'm your host, Allison Gill. Hey, everybody. It's AG. Dana's out today. She has a late flight, so I'll be flying solo today. I hope that's all right with you. I can't wait to talk to her, though, about the women's soccer final. Heartbreaking injury for Megan Rapinoe. But what an incredible match. Uh, MVP, Midge Purse. Um, Gotham FC wins it 2-1. Lavelle was amazing for OL Reign. Allie Krieger will retire on a high note uh, with Gotham FC. Just an all-around incredible match played by incredible women. So thank you for watching if you did. Also, later in the show today, I'm going to be speaking with Officer Harry Dunn about a filing from Jack Smith that Andy McCabe and I discuss on the latest episode of the Jack Podcast. You don't want to miss that discussion. And we do have a few quick hits today. And to make a long story short, too late. All right, first up, about a week ago, Jack Smith filed a motion with a D.C. court in the Trump coup case that says the DOJ does not support televising the trial. And regardless of what we think about that, I think it should be televised. A lot of people think it should be televised. A lot of people don't think it should be televised. But regardless of all that, Jack Smith conferred with the Trump team, as they're supposed to, per court rules, so that they can get their input and put it in their motion. And the Trump team said, we take no position on whether the trial should be televised. But then late Friday night, a couple days later, Trump's team filed a bombastic motion saying they absolutely want the trial televised. Absolutely. Their filing had no basis in law, no case citations. It used incendiary political language, void of context or meaning. And many of us saw it for what it was. Donald Trump, knowing the court will likely rule against cameras in the courtroom, wanted to make it clear he was for televising the trial so that when it's not televised, he can play the victim and fundraise and say the outcome isn't fair. They didn't even televise it. I wanted it televised. Kind of like how he didn't check the jury trial box in the New York civil fraud trial. It's like, they didn't even give me a jury trial. Well, he didn't even fight for one. Well, Sunday, Jack Smith gave notice to the court, to Judge Chutkin, that Trump misled the special counsel's office, and the court by saying at first he had no position, but then changing his mind after the DOJ made their filing. And uh, Jack Smith wants permission from the court, leave of court, to respond to Trump's late night Friday filing. Now, Joyce Vance says of the whole incident, counsel has a duty of candor, filing an opposition to the media group's request at the 11th hour after telling special counsel lawyers that they had no position and letting special counsel represent to the court is inconsistent with that duty. While there may not be formal consequences, Trump lawyers give the court reason not to trust them in the future. Lawyers often rely on a judge's confidence. They'll keep their word. There is no reason for Judge Chutkin to do that for Trump's lawyers in the future. So that's from Joyce Vance on Twitter. And of course, Andy and I are going to discuss this um, and any new developments on the next episode of Jack. Also up from Roger Sullenberger at the Daily Beast, on Wednesday, the Federal Election Commission sent two notices to a Republican super PAC called America Great PAC, inquiring about the circumstances surrounding repayments it made for a $16,500 
SBA loan, that's a small business administration loan, it received in June 2020 as part of the COVID relief program. One major problem, among others, that the Daily Beast uncovered about that group is that the PACs in general aren't allowed to take SBA loans. And in 2021, the Justice Department sentenced a Nevada man to 46 months in prison for fundraising for fake political action committees that he created and the other involving COVID-19 relief funds he sought and received through fraudulent applications. So be sure to follow Roger Sullenberger. We'll keep you posted on this story as it unfolds. Uh, right now, this is with the FEC. They've sent the notices out. We don't know if this be, is being criminally investigated by the Department of Justice at this point. Next up, New York Mayor Eric Adams had two phones and an iPad seized by the feds last week in a federal criminal investigation into whether he and his campaign took straw donations from the Turkish government. Apparently, the FBI got inside an SUV with him and said, give us your stuff. And he did. Now, Pete Strzok and I have been covering this story on cleanup on aisle 45, and we will continue to do so. There's a new episode out Wednesday of this week. And your last quick hit from Philip Bump at The Washington Post, another excellent source for news, by the way. So follow Philip Bump if you're not already. He says, to hear President Biden's critics tell it, the United States is sitting on a huge untapped reservoir of oil that the president, out of obsequiousness to left wing environmental activists or maybe just anti-American petulance, refuses to pull out of the ground. If we simply let oil drillers drill, the argument goes, we could drive down gas prices and again serve as the world's gas station, selling our excess to other countries the way we did when Donald Trump was president. Now, we heard rhetoric like this during the third Republican presidential primary debate held in Miami on Wednesday evening, but it would have taken about five seconds of research to see the arguments are wrong, that the United States is pumping more oil now and exporting more oil than it did during Donald Trump's administration. Again, that's from Philip Bump. You can get the full story at The Washington Post. Make sure to follow him. All right. We have a lot of news to get to. Let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. Trump gave a speech at a rally in New Hampshire over the weekend, and the only media headline to get it right that I've seen thus far is from Forbes, which says Trump compares political foes to vermin on Veterans Day, echoing Nazi propaganda. This is from Sarah Dorn. She is a staff writer for Forbes. She said former President Donald Trump pledged to eliminate political extremist groups that lie, steal and cheat on elections, calling them vermin during a speech Saturday and in a truth social post commemorating Veterans Day, echoing a term that Nazis often used in anti-Semitic propaganda to dehumanize Jews, equating them to parasites who spread disease. Trump made a pledge to root out the communists, Marxists, fascists, and radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country. That was in a true social post Saturday, in honor of our great veterans on Veterans Day. Trump accused the groups of doing anything possible to destroy America and the American dream, adding that the threat from outside forces is far less sinister, dangerous, and grave than the threat from within. He repeated the phrasing at a rally at the New Hampshire uh, thing that he did. That was later Saturday, referring to the radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country. He repeated that line and declaring, quote, the real threat is not from the radical right. The real threat is from the radical left. Now, the former president's incendiary rhetoric invokes a term frequently used by Nazis to dehumanize Jews, including a 1939 quote attributed to Hitler, quote, this vermin must be destroyed. The Jews are our sworn enemies. That's what he told uh, the Czech foreign minister, according to historical accounts. The use of vermin, according to Michael Tomaski, the editor of The New Republic, is, quote, an unusual word choice, and it appears in history in chiefly in one context and one context only. Calling Trump's usage straight up Nazi talk in a way he's never done quite before. So that's what Forbes has to say. And anyone who saw his short film at the Ellipse on January 6th will also remember the echoes of the Third Reich in that film. It's plain as day. And we shouldn't ignore it. A lot of people I know are like, don't spread what he says. Don't spread what he says. This needs to not be ignored, especially by the mainstream media. That's why I said that, the, you know, Forbes was the only one to get it right. I think New York Times headline was something along the lines of, Trump's speech in New Hampshire went a very different way or something very friendly uh, like that. I, I mean, does the media understand that in a Trump second term, they will be the first to go? The free press will be the first to go. Do they think like he'll be cool with them now? 
that he'll be chill with the New York Times after that multi-part series by the, the, the amazing uh, Ann Craig on his finances? Do you think do you think like he'll be chill with the Washington Post? Do you think he's going to be cool with CNN or MSNBC or even Fox News at this point? He denounces them all. He's he, he's not the kind of guy to like bring you back into his good graces. So we need to keep pointing that out. That is dark language. And in other fascist as fuck news, four Ohio Republican state lawmakers are seeking to strip judges of their power to interpret an abortion rights amendment after voters opted to enshrine those rights in the state's constitution this week. Republican state reps Jennifer Gross, Bill Dean, Melanie Miller, and Beth Lear said in a news release Thursday that they'll push to have the legislature, not the courts, make any decisions about the amendment passed on Tuesday. Quote, to prevent mischief by pro-abortion courts with issue one, Ohio legislators will consider removing jurisdiction from the judiciary over this ambiguous ballot initiative, unquote. That's a mix of fairly new and veteran lawmakers who are all vice chairs of various House committees in Ohio. Quote, the Ohio legislature alone will consider what, if any, modifications to make to existing laws based on public hearings and input from legal experts on both sides, unquote. Wow. So they tried to have a special election to raise the threshold to 60 percent of the vote to change the Constitution. And then when that failed and the voters spoke on issue one and issue two, for that matter, now that they don't like it, they say we should be in charge of determining whether that happens, what happens with the Constitution, what happens with this amendment based on input from legal experts. Uh huh. We know what that means. It's the latest development in the struggle over abortion rights between the Republican-dominated legislature and the majority of the voters who passed Issue 1, 57 to 43. Abortion rights advocates plan to ask the courts to repeal any remaining abortion bans and restrictions on the books in Ohio, including a mandatory 24-hour period that abortion seekers must wait before they can have the procedure and a ban on abortions after a fetal diagnosis of Down syndrome. The House Speaker... Jason Stevens declined to comment on the release, according to his spokesperson, Aaron Mulvey. However, Stevens was among the dozens of legislative Republicans who have vowed to fight back against the new amendment. Fight back against the will of the voters is what they want to do. Quote, the legislature has multiple paths that we will explore to continue to protect innocent life. This is not the end of the conversation, Stevens previously said in a news release. Now, if the amendment or any other abortion restrictions were to end up being challenged in the courts, it's unclear how they would fare. The state Supreme Court has a conservative majority, and it has the final say over state constitutional issues. So that's, that's just mind-blowing. And Santorum said after Tuesday night's election results, I think he was on Newsmax or something, maybe Fox, I can't remember, some shithole. He said, this is why pure democracy is awful, because they can't control the will of the people. They can't win on their ideas. So they're doubling down on them, and they're trying to prevent what voters decide from going into effect. But in some pro-democracy news, this is from Mark Elias's Democracy Docket, follow it if you're not. Registering to vote could get much easier for people in Michigan, thanks to a bill that cleared the legislature last night. This is a couple nights ago. The final version of the legislation, which passed the state house on a party line vote last night and advanced in the Senate last week, allows Michiganders aged 16 and 17 and a half to pre-register to vote currently. Only those 17 and a half or older could do so before. The legislation also mandates that the Michigan Department of Education coordinate a public education and outreach campaign to inform young voters of the available methods to pre-register or register to vote. If enacted, every public high school in the state will have to provide resources for registering to vote. That's amazing and awesome. Rep. Betsy Coffia, she's a Democrat who sponsored the legislation, said the bill would undoubtedly increase participation in our elections by ensuring when they are legally eligible to vote at 18, they'll be all set to become a lifelong voter. Michigan would be the third Midwestern state to expand registration for young people in recent months. Illinois and Minnesota both passed laws allowing 16 and 17 year olds to pre-register earlier this year. 
The bill now awaits Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer's signature. And next up from Ryan Riley at NBC, an associate of a January 6th defendant pled guilty this week to charges that the two men plotted to murder employees of the FBI. Austin Carter is his name, is a 26-year-old security officer and member of the Army Reserves at the time of his arrest in December of 2022, admitted in a plea agreement that he unlawfully and knowingly combined, conspired, and agreed with his co-defendant, Edward Kelly, to kill FBI personnel. Carter admitted that he provided a cooperating witness, quote, with a list of FBI employees that Carter received from Kelly on or about December 13th, 2022, and that Carter instructed the cooperating witness, quote, to memorize the FBI employees identified on the list and then burn the list. Kelly and Carter discussed plans, quote, to attack the FBI field office in Knoxville, Tennessee, and that the purpose of the conspiracy was, quote, to retaliate against government conduct. A court filing from December said that the list Kelly provided included about 37 names of law enforcement personnel who worked on Kelly's January 6th case and identified which officers were present when Kelly was arrested. Kelly, an anti-abortion activist, was initially arrested in May of 2022 after he was identified as one of the first rioters to breach the Capitol on January 6th. Video from the January 6th riot shows a man identified as Kelly using a piece of wood to breach a window, jumping through the window, and then kicking open a fire escape, allowing other rioters to stream inside. Kelly and Carter were arrested in connection with the alleged murder plot last December. A jury trial for Kelly in the federal murder conspiracy case is scheduled for January, while a status conference in his case for January 6th is set for December. Now, Carter and prosecutors agreed this week that, quote, a sentence not greater than 120 months, that's 10 years in prison, is the appropriate disposition of this case. A detention memo after Carter's arrest noted that, quote, he worked for four different security companies and is a member of the Army Reserves, where he received advanced training. And our last story today from Reuters, Pope Francis on Saturday dismissed Bishop Joseph E. Strickland of Tyler, Texas, one of his fiercest critics among U.S. Roman Catholic conservatives, after he refused to step down following a Vatican investigation. It is very rare for a bishop to be relieved of his duties outright. Usually, bishops in trouble with the Vatican are asked to resign before submitting a resignation, which the Pope accepts. Popes uh, make such moves, uh, considered drastic, by the way, when a bishop refuses the request to resign. Strickland is 65, 10 years shy of the usual retirement age for bishops. Cardinal Daniel DiNardo of Galveston, Houston, said in a statement that Strickland was asked to resign on November 9th, but he refused to do so. Strickland, a prolific user of social media, who was named to the diocese by the late Pope Benedict in 2012, tweeted earlier this year that he rejected Pope Francis's program undermining the deposit of faith. He has been particularly critical of the Pope's attempt to make the church more welcoming to the LGBTQ plus community and attempts by Pope Francis to give lay people more responsibility in the church. The Vatican statement on Saturday announcing the dismissal gave no reason. Strickland indicated in an interview with the ultra conservative website LifeSite News that one reason was his refusal to implement Vatican directives to restrict the use of the old style Latin mass favored by some conservatives. Quote, I stand by all the things that were listed as complaints against me. I do it the same way again. I feel very much at peace in the Lord and the truth that he died for. That's what Strickland said. The dismissal followed a Vatican investigation earlier this year into the administration of the Tyler Diocese, which Catholic media reports said included a review of his handling of financial affairs. DiNardo said the investigation concluded that Strickland's continuation in office was not feasible. Strickland had become one of the most vocal standard bearers of the ultra-conservative wing of the U.S. Church, and has a national following far beyond the small diocese of Tyler in eastern Texas. Last August, the Pope lamented what he called a reactionary Catholic church in the United States, where he said political ideology had replaced faith in some cases. Strickland is among a strong supporter of former U.S. President Donald Trump and is seen as a hero by conservative U.S. Catholic media outlets that are aligned with Donald Trump. All right, everybody, stick around. I'm going to get Officer Harry Dunn's reaction to Jack Smith's recent filing, pinning the blame for the Capitol attack directly on Donald Trump. You don't want to miss this interview. Stick around. We'll be right back. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody, welcome back. I'm happy, so happy to be joined today by New York Times bestselling author, 
Uh, the, yes, indeed. Hello. <laughs> the book is called Standing My Ground. It's my friend Harry Dunn. Hi, Harry. How are you? Hey, AG. What's up? Good to good to be here with you. It's good to see you, my friend. And of course, everybody, first off, like just go buy Standing My Ground. Go get it now. Yes. It's available wherever books are sold. It's truly, truly incredible. If you want to get the three, it makes a good Christmas gift. Yeah. Make a good Christmas gift. Get the three for for your family, right? Harry yes. Dunn's book, Sergeant Gannell's book, and uh, and Mike and Mike Fanone's yeah. book. Yeah. Um, it's a great little gift set. It's really just incredible reading. Well, why you add that? It's interesting because our books, although we, you know, all of us have very different experiences that day, all of them are very different um, in nature. You know, while, you know, Sergeant Donnell's is talking about the sacrifice and the journey that he, you know, fought through being an immigrant and coming and serving his country that he chose. A lot of people just, we, ch- we, we serve our country that we end up, we're born here. You know, a lot of people born in America, so we're Americans. But he chose to be an American citizen and, you know, fighting for his country. And then, you know, Michael Fanone is just telling the story of, you know, how he fought his ass off and have people denying what he went through and, you know, just how he was determined to see it all the way through. And my book is just, it's a cry for, democracy and how fragile this shit is and like how our country at any moment especially now is we're one election away from becoming an authority a dictatorship and we can't be bystanders we have to participate in democracy so all three of them just point to paint a very different picture um all things stemming from january 6th so yeah, and, and that's the importance of storytelling, is the different perspectives, the lived experiences, not just uh, for that day, but everything that led up to that day and beyond. So yeah. it's um, really, uh, truly an incredible book. All of them are. Um, so really, uh, grab your copy today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course. Now, what I wanted to talk to you about today, because I, I've been thinking about you a lot over the weekend, because last week, a filing came in, in the D.C. case against Donald Trump, the federal case against Donald Trump for his obstructing an official proceeding, conspiracy against rights, and conspiracy to defraud the United States. And, you know, it, uh, the, the, when I read it, the first thing I flashed back to was your testimony to the January 6th committee. A lot of people think that the committee hearing started in the summer of 2022. Man, yeah. they go back. Yeah. They go back when the four of you, the three we just mentioned, and Danny Hodges testified before the January 6th Select Committee about what happened to you that day. And what stuck with me is, you know, when they asked you, what would you like us to do here? You know, not in a rude way, like, what do you want us to do? No, like, tell us yeah, what you want, yeah. what you need from us. You said, look, if somebody hires a hitman and that hitman goes and kills somebody, we get the hitman, but we also get the guy who sent the hitman. Yeah. And you were referring to Donald Trump, who sent the mob to the Capitol to attack the Capitol that day. Yeah. You know, where a lot of where some people perished. There was a lot of violence. It was a you know, some people like to say it was not an armed insurrection. It absolutely was. Uh, yeah. And you were in the middle of it. And it's been a long road. But when that indictment came out from Jack Smith and he indicted him with defrauding the United States, obstru- obstructing an official proceeding. There was no insurrection in there. There was no seditious conspiracy. And it didn't seem like, I mean, they mentioned the attack on the Capitol, but it didn't feel like they were going after the hitman for what he did yeah. that day. Um, and so when I read what he wrote, what Jack Smith wrote, what he's going to prove in this trial, I felt like I wanted to ask you about it. So let me read this yeah. to you because it, it really hits pretty hard. Definitely. They say, in this case, the defendant seeks to distance himself, moving to strike allegations in the indictment related to the actions at the Capitol on January 6th. Because what, what Trump was trying to do was file a motion to say that the language tying him to January 6th and the attack on the Capitol is uh, prejudicial, like it's prejudicial and it's incendiary. And, you know, so we, we want to strike it from the indictment. That's so wild to me, just to cut you off real quick. Those are, but it's the own freaking words. Like we talk about presidential and incendiary. Have he has he listened to himself talk? Every single word that he says is inflammatory. And like, give me a fucking break. Like, <laughs> yeah. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. Well, Jack Smith says the court should recognize the defendant's motion for what it is: a meritless effort to evade the indictment's clear allegations that the defendant is responsible for the events at the Capitol on January sixth. 
That is the first we have heard uh, from the Department of Justice saying putting the blame. Yep, putting the blame directly on him for what happened. What what do you what are your thoughts on that? It's good because like I when I made that analogy at the hearing, you know, one reason why I feel so confident and I wasn't stating my opinion that Donald Trump sent those guys there. They told us in their own words on the six. We were telling them to leave, and they said they wouldn't leave because Donald Trump invited us. And, you know, we were told to come here by the president. So th those people there, like I said, that wasn't my hypothesis or some, you know, some random thought that I had. Donald Trump, those individuals told us they weren't leaving because Donald Trump said that they could be there. Mm -hmm. So that's why I felt so strong in saying Yo, he sent these people here. Like we, we weren't watching. I at the time I wasn't watching the rally or, you know, and everything. But I mean, even the the tweet that goes back to uh, in 2020, late 2020, when he said, "Be there, it's going to be wild." Or no, I think Steve Bannon said that or somebody. No, it was but Donald Trump in a tweet. It was Trump. Yeah. But it was Trump's tweet. So you know, it's kind of like that uh, passive aggressive stuff where he told them to do it, but he didn't really say, "Oh, go beat the crap out of them." But it's kind of like implied. They wouldn't have been there if he told him not to be there. That's the bottom line. Yeah. And Jack Smith does take it a step further in this filing. He didn't just send them there and it's up to them to be violent. Right. That's Jack Smith says yeah. that's not what happened here. He goes on to say, indeed, that day was the culmination of the defendant's criminal conspiracies to overturn the legitimate results of the election when the defendant directed a large and angry crowd one that he had summoned to Washington, D.C., fueled with knowingly false claims of election fraud to the Capitol to obstruct the congressional certification proceeding. And when his supporters did so, including through violence, the defendant did not try to stop them. Instead, he encouraged them and attempted to leverage their actions by further obstructing the certification. Contrary to the defendant's claims, then, the indictment's allegations related to the actions at the Capitol are relevant and probative evidence of the defendant's conduct and intent, and they are neither prejudicial nor inflammatory, and his motion to strike them from the indictment must be denied. So he's acknowledging, Jack Smith, that it wasn't just that he said, go and protest peacefully the thing, you know, he's saying yeah. he sent them there knowing they were angry. He made them angry. With by perpetuating false narrative, the false, the debunked, um, well, even in his inner circle. And that's what I'm going to, I'm glad you can, you and Andy can talk about that a little more. I'm curious what y'all got to say. But when, um, how much of this is reflective of what Mark Meadows um, being able to give them information? Because who was with him all day that day or within an earshot of him? And it was Mark Meadows. And, you know, so I, I'm curious to know now, obviously, you know, we know what we know because of the January 6th committee and their excellent work. But Mark Meadows knows so much about what Donald Trump's actions and inactions of that day. Yeah. And what's even, you know, to take this even a little bit further, we have Jack Smith talking about what he's going to prove at trial. And, and this is kind of the big reveal here. So he set it up. He's like, this was the culmination. This was the centerpiece of his uh, attempts to to block the certification and overturn the election results. It was violent. He made them violent using knowing lies and and sent them there. And then he says, at trial, the government will prove these allegations with evidence that the defendant's supporters took obstructive actions at the Capitol at the defendant's direction and on his behalf. Mm -hmm. The indictment also alleges and the government will prove at trial that the defendant used the angry crowd at the Capitol as a tool in his pressure campaign on the vice president and to obstruct the congressional certification. And in particular, the government will establish through testimony and video evidence that after the defendant repeatedly and publicly pressured and attacked the vice president, the rioting crowd at the Capitol turned their anger toward the VP when they learned that he would not halt the certification, asking where the vice president was and chanting that they would hang him. And next, the government will prove that the defendant's knowing and corrupt intent is clear from his actions and purposeful inaction during the attack on the Capitol. The allegations in the indictment are not unduly prejudicial or inflammatory. In fact, 
evidence of the attack on the Capitol on January 6th is powerful and probative evidence of the defendant's conduct, motive, and intent. So nice. Wow. Yeah, that's I <laughs> shit. That's that's I can't I can't wait to see how this unfolds. Um not necessarily because I don't feel like I there's when when all this stuff started, it always said we don't know what we don't know. Like how much, how deep does this go? And I feel like with that, there's so much more that we are going to learn at trial. Like, can you imagine learning more stuff about January 6th already? Like, we don't even know what questions to ask, but I feel like we're just, we're going to get our eyes opened up even more on uh, with March 4th when the trial starts. So does this filing, does knowing what Jack Smith thinks and intends to prove at trial make you kind of feel any differently uh, now than you did before about kind of where justice is headed? No. Uh, well, I, the only, I guess different, not really, but I do feel that are the officers who have been vocal about getting justice, um, our cries have not gone unheard. And, you know, I, he'll never acknowledge that and that, you know that's fine i don't care but well it's you know it, personally he, i don't i don't anticipate that but the fact that he's is taking it serious it makes it seem like we're not as crazy as we think we are by us on this little crusade <laughs> us meaning the officers who testify have been on this public crusade for accountability and um, it makes it feel like it's not in vain. Yeah. I mean, Harry, he's telling you, he's, yeah. he's telling us in this filing, I heard you, I'm going after the hitman. Exactly. And that and that's what makes me, yeah, it, it's worth it. It feels like, I don't say vindication, but yeah, why not? It's a little vin vindication, you know? Well, it's got to feel like, you know, for the longest time uh, with, with the stuff that I have PTSD over has nothing to do with the attack in the Capitol, but to finally hear the military say, yes, we agree with you. Yes, this happened to you. It was like I was no longer being gaslit. Somebody yeah. else believed what I thought in my head and and backed me up on it. And I was no longer alone. And so when I read this filing, I was like, fuck yeah, Harry's not alone. Like yeah. Jack Smith is with him. He's like, I'm going after the hitman. The, he, the attack on the Capitol is Donald Trump's responsibility. And anybody who th agrees with me, you're not crazy. Yeah. And, and you know, what? and that's that's what it's all about. Um, unfortunately, they're going to people who no matter what the evidence shows that are still going to no, you know how those, those, those people go. But there's nothing that you could say or show them to make them see any different. And, you know, that's is what it is. But yeah, man, I'm 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 anxious. But like in a um, March 4th, you can't get here soon enough, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I was all worried that, you know, we were thinking oh, it's just going to be a case about the fraudulent electors, you know, yeah, or this or that. But no, he was going directly after the hitman. And I, I really I'm glad I got to talk to you about it because I was interested how you might feel about it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm also like when he gave his, the speaking indictment, I guess that that's what it's called when he in, first announced the charges. He acknowledged the law enforcement that day. And I thought that that was going to be, you know, hey, guys, he you know, good job for saving this country, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I forgot about that. That that just sort of yeah. lends to the credence that he heard you. Correct. Yeah. So that that's what made it a little bit more. Yeah, he he sees us because what people people just want to be seen. That's it. People want to be seen. People want to be heard and and believed. Yeah, e exactly. You know about that. And he, he does. So, like I said, it, we can't get here soon enough. All right. Well, I'm going to text you the the. This is a pretty short filing. I think you should frame it because <laughs> because I think I will. I think I will with all the other you know souvenirs I got from this uh this terrible day. So I mean, because like I read my victory in court over my abusive ex like all the time to yeah. be like, fuck yeah. yeah, I was right. I was right. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. And so you know, I've read this filing a few times too. And uh, you know, you you were on my mind. Uh, this weekend about it. Well, I appreciate so. you. And yeah, that that's, yeah, I'm excited. All right. Cool, man. Hey, thank you again, everybody. One more time, pick up your copy yeah. of Standing My Ground. It's true, like seriously, beautifully written, incredible story. Um, thank you. They make thank you. amazing holiday gifts. Um, I mean, you're so very hopeful uh, despite everything that's gone down. And uh, I can't thank you enough for that. Harry Dunn. Of course. Thanks for having me. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. 
Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone. Good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, if you want to give a shout out to your spouse or a loved one or a partner or someone in your family or a friend of yours or a small business in your area that could use a boost or your small business, let us know what you're making, what you're creating. I would love to hear about that. If you want to send in your dissertation titles or your thesis titles, those are amazing and awesome. And I get I get so confused by some of the stuff that y'all have studied and are studying. It's it's pretty intense. I love those. Whoopie stories, blanky stories, stuffed animal stories, um, happy places. Have you, what are you doing for the holidays? I would love to know that. Um, Halloween photos are always great. I know it's past Halloween, but I still love those. Uh, baby pictures, frog orgies, anything, anything you want to send us dailybeanspod.com. Click on contact. First up from Mary R in Indiana, pronoun she and her. Hi, AG and DG. Thank you a thousand times over for your glorious snarky and sweary take on the typically wretched news of the day. It has helped me tremendously since my husband passed in February of 2022. The morning goes on, but your pod elevates my spirits and diverts my anxious mind. Thank you, Mary. Here's a picture of the Trump King jack-o'-lantern that my engineer son and I collaborated on for our Halloween decor. I do not have a pet. So instead, uh, I'm uh, here is a photo of some fall colors. <laughs> that is great. It's potato with the butthole lips and then the, the hair with the top. That's fantastic. Wonderful, Mary. They're both great. I like the, the skull over there, too. Excellent pumpkins. Oh, that's a beautiful tree. Thank you for sending that. Next up from Melinda and Boo, pronoun she and her. Thank you so much for your reporting. My cat, Boo, pronoun she and her, loves listening to the Daily Beans. Hi, Boo Boo. Today she was listening to Dana read about Mike Johnson and was mesmerized by her voice. She also is excited about the new Refried Beans episodes. Refried, uh, refried Beans looks like cat food. Ha <laughs> ha. Please keep Boo in your thoughts. She's suffering from cancer. I don't know how long she'll be with us. Please know your voices have comforted her through the good news and bad. Boo, I love you. I boop your snoot. I give you belly rubs and send all the love and positive healing vibes. Melinda, thanks for that. What a beautiful tuxedo girl with the little freckle on her nose. Absolutely adorable. I'm glad you're enjoying the refried beans. I love it. I love going back look, and trying to pick these episodes out. It, it's fun. So I'm glad you guys are liking it. As you know, send in your thoughts. Um, it's, it's amazing how far we've come. Uh, and then sometimes it's like, wow, you know, that took a long time or we're still working on that. Holy shit. It's been two years. It's fascinating, fascinating stuff. Next up from Dana R. Hey, AG and DG. I, I just enjoyed the refried beans episodes from November of 2020. Can you believe all the shit that we still had not learned about back then? I'm keeping the faith that Letitia James, Fonnie Willis, and Jack Smith's good works will prevail to help save our democracy. Keep doing what you're doing to bring us the truth. Dana, thank you so much. Next up from Anonymous, no pronouns. Shout out to Horizontal.co. That's H-O-R-I-Z-O-N-T-L dot C-O. A group of very thoughtful people in London working to make sex work safe, private, healthy, and a viable career path. Excellent. Speaking of bodily autonomy, consenting adults should be able to have relations and yes, charge for it. Doing it safely is really, really hard. However, a group in London, UK is, a, is better than US for acceptance, is working on a solution to solve the safety, security, privacy, and health of sex workers. That's horizontal.co. Wonderful. Thank you, Anonymous, for that information. Next up from Stephen. Hi, Beans Queens. Been listening since kitchen table days, and I'm always so grateful for the news with swearing. I retired four years ago and moved to the small coastal town uh -oh, of Yahats. Okay, Yahats. Uh, there is a delightful restaurant here called Beach Street Kitchen, which serves fantastic meals made from scratch from local and organic ingredients. The delicious food is accompanied by the happiest and sweetest workers I've ever seen. If you're ever on the Oregon coast, I highly recommend you check them out. For pet tax, here's a picture of my lovely cat, Pip. I love this. Beach Street Kitchen. It's beautiful. I love the art. And there is the pride flag displayed prominently. Wonderful. Look at the baby kitty. Sleeping in the shrimp position. Love it. Thank you so much for that. 
Next up from Cheryl, I wanted to shout out my husband of 48 years. Congratulations. I call him my mail order husband. We met through my uncle who was in the Navy with him. He asked me to write to his friends because letters from home meant so much to him. Jack served in the Navy, and then when he left the Navy, he continued to serve as a firefighter paramedic until he retired after 32 years. What an incredible life of public service, Cheryl. As pet tax, here is my necklace of kittens. <laughs> Look at the three of them. Oh, my goodness. Cheryl, did a kitty have kittens in your home? Look at there's an orange. There's a ginger. Those are usually boys, and they're usually clowny. They're like total dorks. Uh, and then there's a gray tabby that looks very soft. And then there's a void. So adorable. Thank you for that. Next up from Anonymous, he and him. Hi, Beans Queens. First, let me say you guys rock. I am so grateful for your podcast. Thank you, Anonymous. It is so valuable in disseminating the litany of information as it pertains to Mr. Fuckface and his attempted coup and the consequential legal action taken on America's behalf. So thank you. Listening to the refried beans today, the service you provide, as I'm sure you know, is invaluable to those suffering short attention spans, myself included. You stand alone and above information outlets, keeping hindsight 2020. My bandwidth drops off, as I suspect is designed and engineered by mainstream media, with the volume of obfuscation and just the simple volume of what floods the ubiquitous screens and audio of our post maga malu. Uh, what, uh, you wield the remedy, and I hope other outlets catch on. Those that spew crackpot rhetoric can't possibly bring forth the retrospective conclusions without cherry picking. So well put. On this Veterans Day weekend, I encourage you to soldier on and never lose the trail you have set upon. My boy Arlo for pet tax just turned 10. I love him so. He's a healer, border collie mix, my wingman and co-pilot for a decade now. And there he is standing inside the dishwasher on the open door, looking adorable AF. Oh, look at that. And there he is, full grown. What a sweetie baby. Thank you so much for that, Anonymous. What a great submission. I really appreciate that. That's kind of the, that's kind of the point <laughs> of, of, of what I'm trying to do and what uh, Dana and I are trying to accomplish. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody for sending your stuff in. I'd love to hear what you think about refried beans. I'd love to think about how far you think we've come or not. Anything that you want to send to us, you know you can do it at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. Thanks to Harry Dunn, my dear friend uh, and American hero. Please get his book, Standing My Ground. Uh, it's going to be a great Christmas gift. Thank you all so much for listening. Dana and I, I promise Dana will be back tomorrow uh, in your ears. Until then, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Take care of your family. Vote blue over Q and bring someone with you. I've been AG and them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. <laughs>